when I wrote the script, I don't, I don't think about casting just because it, it's too specific to think about one actor who you might or might not get. So just try to write the characters as clearly and as well as possible and not, not think about who would, who would play them. And then as soon as it's done, it's, you know, you sit, you're sitting with a producer and what are we going to do, who are we going to go to? And I, to me, Reggie was the lead, and I knew I had to cast Reggie first. And whether that actor became Ron as well or, or didn't was, was a different um, matter or a different uh, issue. And not knowing if the actor who would even want to play both parts. So you're open to the idea of going one way either or the way, other. Okay. Either way. And knowing that <clears throat> one guy playing both parts could be a gimmick that the film doesn't survive. Mm -hmm. But if you cast separate guys, and the second guy you cast is is got to look like the first guy, so right. you, you're limited that way. Anyways, I gave it to Tom. I didn't know him. Um, I had really liked him in the film Warrior, and thought there was something Reggie Cray like about about that performance. And he read it, and we had dinner, and um, all he wanted to talk about was Ron. All, all I would he talk want about to play Reggie. He, no, he did, it was too straight for Tom. It was too much of a leading man for right. Tom. And um, all I went on about was Reggie, and, and basically it was his kind of standoff at dinner, <laughs> friendly standoff. And uh, at the end of dinner, he basically said, look, I'll give you Reggie if you give me Ron. And I said, That's okay. a fair trade. And I said, okay. <laughs> and neither of us realized what a dumb thing we had just, or, or we, neither of us agreed, realized what we had just agreed to, I should say. <laughs> When you get that idea, there's obviously, since the Parent Trap, the original Parent Trap film came out, there's been an evolution of technology. But I wonder, if at a certain point, you are using the same things that the Parent Trap did. In other words, yeah. how much has technology made your job easier, and how much is it still a pain in the ass? I don't, you know, I don't think it's made it that much easier. The um, Parent Trap is split screens, I think, mostly. Yeah. And we mostly are split screens. Um, because it's digital, we have the luxury of not having to have a, a, a vertical line. We don't have to have one guy standing in a doorway all the time so we can join the two halves. Um, but it's the same idea. Um, and then there's motion control if the camera's moving. But it was so, the rigs were so big and it took so long, we, didn't, we couldn't shoot too many of them just because it took forever to get a shot. So how does Tom do the dialogue? Is he listening to playback? Over speaker, does he well, have we'd, I IFB? Or yeah, what we'd re so the tricks are the tricks. I mean, the right. technologies, we, you know, you learn the shots you can do when you do them. Um, and, but the bigger thing is the dynamic is getting that dynamic between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And so he would come in in the morning, and we, he'd always play Reggie first, and I'd read Ron, and he'd read Reggie, and then he, we'd flip. And then any kind of ad-libs, we had to work them out then. Um, just sort of the two of us, and I, I, I always love to ad lib, but but we, we couldn't do it on set with another actor, so to speak, with that energy between the two actors. And the best way to describe it is, is if you had made Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, and and Paul Newman and Robert Redford hated each other, <laughs> and wouldn't be on set at the same time as the other actor, <laughs> and that's basically what he was up against. So he he uh, he had to. Even, for example, Ron is gesticulates a lot and waves cigars around and things like that. And on our overs, we'd shoot over onto Tom as Reggie. And Tom would have to think through what his reactions were going to be, teach him to his body double, and his body double would do him first. But Tom would, would work that out, and we'd figure it all out so that when Tom came in, he could, he could slide into it. Otherwise, the, the right. overs wouldn't cut. He, when he was Ron, he was always in a really good mood as an actor and always had his arm around me and what are we doing? And if I said, you know, go over there and stand on your head, he'd say, sure, no questions or anything like that. Um, and when he was Reggie, he was much more standoffish and, and the crew loved Ron. He was always like <laughs> hugging the crew and talking to them. And, and, um, but when Reggie would show up, he'd always be on the edge of the set just kind of observing everything and vaguely uh, suspicious of whatever you had to say to him. And uh, I didn't tell him till the end, but it was. You didn't tell him what to the end? 
that there was a difference. I oh, don't okay. think he knew there was a difference, but uh, it was much, it wasn't easier direct than Ron, but it was more, it was, it was just much friendlier and, and, um, and Tom, as Reggie, you had to make sure you had answers to everything. And, um, and I think it was how they were, mm -hmm. from what I've read, it was how they were in real life, especially when Ron was in a good mood. If people have been to East London the last couple of years, they would know that it's incredibly gentrified. Google's building an office there. But what was it like at that period? And what did East London represent to West London in terms of the people who lived there and what they aspired to in West London? Well, I think East London, you know, they took it the worst in the war mm -hmm. as far as uh, bo being bombed. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, you know, there's a class system in London that, you know, the, if you, you're, you're in the hole if you're born in the East end of London, um, and it's, it's a tough one to get out of. Um, but um, it was very much, you know, like the East of a lot of cities, you know, the East End, Lower East Side of New York. Um, it's a place that immigrants came through, um, East LA, and it's, it's, it's uh, I'm from East Providence, which is similar. The, um, but, um, it was a place to, to land, you know, get started, and, and then move move out of, and that's still it's, that's still the case today. It's a it's a very, um, I guess, Pakistani neighborhood, mm -hmm. Indian neighborhood now, um, and they were part of that um, that group. And were you largely able to film in East London? No, no. So that neighborhood is gone. What you no, need? You, where did you find the neighborhoods? You, you a used? little bit in East London, um, but uh, all over the behind. If you know London, behind Waterloo Station and in Greenwich, um, and and all over the city. And we just could find a couple of little blocks here and there. Um, the um, my location manager told me a very funny story about a German director was there, and they were doing. A Dickens novel, mm -hmm. I forget which one, and uh, we'll just say it was Bleak House. <laughs> and uh, he could never find a reverse, so they'd find a nice thing right. here, and then he'd, the reverse would be some glass building. And finally, the guy had a fit and said, "What is it with this place? You can't find a reverse anywhere." And the location manager said, "Yeah, because because you guys blew all the reverses up." 